and we are live. It is Friday, December 17th, 2021, 5.01 p.m. I decided this morning that it was one of those days when you gratify a member of the audience by wearing the most ridiculous dog shirt you own <laughs> because Paula gave it to me. It is too tight. Uh, it has a frickin' butterfly on it. Um, so, uh, In fact, all that... we can see is the butterfly right now. That's right, and, and the uh, pterodactyl. Um, uh, and uh, it's that kind of day, and on that kind of day, when you're gonna do that kind of thing, there's only one kind of guest to have. It is Mike Pesca. Um, Mike, it's been a few Antan twigs. Yeah, the plural is Antan twiggies. And I guess your shirt shows when a butterfly flaps its wings on your left pectoral, a riot of puppies break out somewhere in the stomach area. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Look, we are not allowed to have fun anymore, folks. And it's gotten so bad that Scott Shapiro has started tweeting about a second season of the uh, <laughs> Jurisprudence uh, course course podcast. podcast, which... Um, you know, that was done in the depths of despair of early spring 2020. You could hear yeah. the ambulances going by Scott's yeah. apartment while he's calling his mom on what is <laughs> one of the called? most eccentric podcasts ever made on any subject. Um, Especially jurisprudence. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, there were definitely some concerned calls in the administration of the <laughs> Yale Law School who were like, is, is he okay? Um, right. But yeah. uh, look, if Omicron brings us the Omicron season of the Jurisprudence podcast, um, uh, it's like the Matrix 4, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It'll be it'll be that good. Um, but it, do, 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 before we just start into the show, I would just want to ask: Are are you? Is everyone feeling dark, or um, or? Cause I'm feeling like I'm feeling like we're we're entering another very bad period. I mean, uh, New what York. You, what do you just, think, Pesca? Are you feeling yeah. dark about Omicron? As I drive around the city, I see those. Um, testing sites that were normally just walk up and get tested having huge lines. And it's surprised me a couple of times. What is this line about? And it would always end in a testing site. Yeah. And then you see that the case loads have doubled. On the other hand, <sighs> there is no evidence that it's, um, it is more virulent, right? And virulent we think means harmful, but it doesn't seem to be more severe. And so I don't know what the percentage, but it seems like a pretty good percent that this winds up being the thing that delivers us from our worst fears, that widespread COVID that doesn't hurt us much, right? COVID becoming something akin to the flu. Both things can happen. Yeah, yeah, but I would just say, I think that that's exactly right what will happen. But as we pass through that and it cuts down the unvaccinated, um, yeah. it's going to be, it it's going to be horrible and it's going to be many, lots of human suffering, but, and that's the darkness I meant, but I do think you're right. I do think we're all getting COVID and the question is, are we living through it or not? Um, uh, cause it does seem like extraordinarily, um, uh, transmissible regardless yeah, of, of its severity. I'll give you two data points. One is um, David Leonhardt, who I think is the, just the best writer on this for, from a layman's perspective, not, not a scientist, really emphasizing that caseloads are a bad metric. We're testing more. It's showing up more. But it's because we're testing more. Witness those lines. So I take that to heart. And then I heard Ed Young on uh, the Brian Lair show today saying he personally canceled his party, his 40th birthday party. I have a 50th birthday party in three weeks, and I'm nervous. All right, yeah. well, let's talk about that because I'm older and wiser because I'm 52. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, and so uh, what are your, what are your, like, now that you're going to enter your second half century of life, uh, yeah. do you, uh, do you have any deep thoughts on the subject? Uh, cue the Jack Handy music and the picture of the uh, trees. <laughs> 
I have been, and it's not exactly because I'm 50. It's because I'm going to be uh, relaunching season two of The Gist, and it's because, um, you know, I've been looking over uh, things like IRAs. I'm now calculating backwards from when I stopped working as opposed to having calculated from when I started. I mean, this is a practical I'm doing that with death these days, actually. <laughs> like, I, you know, one of the things about being over 50 is you cannot kid yourself that you are likely to be closer to birth than death. Mm -hmm. When you're in your 40s, you can do that. You can, you can sort of say, well, you know, 49 is still in your 40s and 40... Uh, 40 times two is 80. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, you know, to twice my, age. and of course it's mathematically nonsense, but it's psychologically comforting. You yeah. can't do that in your fifties. No. You know, I'm, I'm not likely to live to be 104. And no. so I am almost certainly closer I, to death I, than, than birth and probably can, significantly so. Ben, can I just say, um, that you've significantly helped my, uh, dark mood. <laughs> Thank you. I, I aim to please. <laughs> Great. I, I was feeling bad, and yeah. now you've lifted my spirits. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so when, when you die, someone will say, wow, that was young. But they won't feel it in their bones that they have to say with anguish, oh, my God, so young. It's like, that is young. You know, from an actuarial standpoint, that it's more of an intellectual expression of how young you are if you die in your 50s, as opposed to a tormented emotional expression. Do you think so? I think dying in your 50s, that's really young. It's, I feel that way about dying in your 60s, that there's mm -hmm. like a, that they're like, you're obliged to say it was very young, but you kind of don't feel it. Whereas, you know, uh, the dying in your like, late teens that that stuff just you hits you in the gut and t noodles around in there i think decades are like how cool uh, a neighborhood is in a cross street in manhattan like the teens are cool right and the 20s are pretty cool right. pretty nice but when you get to like the 40s and the 50s you really want to get to at least to the 70s or 80s before you could start being although what do you, you know, do what do you do there with the with the you know, 120s. Like there's, there's more. You know, you get up into the Harlem teens start and, over again. It's Washington like the cheap Heights. teens. It's yeah, you have to name teens. it after na neighborhoods, right? Then you just become, you know, a geriatric. Uh, that's or, like old and fucking old. That's like the Spanish really Harlem of old. people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I kind of buy that. All right, um, Mike Pesca. It's been a while since you've been on the show. What have you been up to recently? I heard a great interview on the Howard Stern show yesterday with Ben Affleck. Oh my God. I saw that headline. Now, right. so, so let's talk headline. about it. Okay. So this is why I'm interested, especially for this show. Um, disinformation. There is the question of, is it that we have the tools that allow us to spread or allow malefactors to spread disinformation and therefore they will? Or is it that manu malefactors want to spread disinformation, therefore they use the tools? Clearly it's both. But, you know, historically, like all these lies about the Pope endorsing Trump or Hillary Clinton having sickness, those were just started by amoral teens in, what was it, Moldova, Montenegro? I forget which country. Macedonia, right? Probably Macedonia. Macedonia. So, so Macedonian teens who didn't care who won the election, just wanted to make some money. And it was just that they had the tools to do so, and they made a little bit of money and it spread like wildfire. So this, this would point to... Um, this would point to the tools are there. It's things are so easily um, warped into disinformation. What the Howard Stern, Ben Affleck interview shows is that exactly. Because uh, in a sentence, Ben Affleck gave one of the best, most revealing, honest, emotional, raw, telling interviews, mostly about his relationship with his father, because he's promoting a movie with that as the theme, and how his father was an addict and um, an alcoholic, and the headline anecdotes, which, which I could share with you, were gutting and revealing. And of course, it's Affleck. They were dramatic and cinematic. And then he talked honestly about his life and his wife and, and drinking. And you just felt for the guy. And you were just, as someone who listened to the whole interview, um, as it happened live and was texting friends, you've got to hear this. This is a master class in Revelation. I was blown away. And then who was headline, good? Like, was it because yeah. of stern's interviewing skills or was it's it so because 
Like Affleck yeah. decided to open up. Hmm. I think about this a lot. Affleck decided to open up because of Stern's interviewing skills some, but yeah. <laughs> persona and personality. So I said this uh, to Michelle, my wife, I said, you know, it's a really good interview and Stern got him to give a lot. But if you look at classic interviewing technique with things like open-ended questions, he didn't really ask them. Stern would say, it must be very hard to know that your father either didn't love you or didn't love you. This is how you processed it as a kid, didn't love you enough to show up sober and to be there for you. It must be very hard. I mean, that's not even a question, that's an observation. But the reason it worked, Michelle said, ah, but what Stern has done is display vulnerability throughout his whole career. So like you come into Stern knowing, okay, this is, if I'm gonna get emotional, if I'm really gonna go for it in any one interview, this is gonna be the interview for you, I do it. And I think most people like Ben Affleck or I've, you know, Billie Eilish did the same thing. So it's people of all different ages really like Stern. They like that he's honest. They like that he, you know, is I guess non-judgmental. But Terry Gross asks better questions. Howard Stern gets better answers, I would say. Mm, nice. That's so okay. good. That was so really I'm good. Like, Terry Gross. I just want to nope. say uh, there's <laughs> nope. a very important poll up. Um, uh, and um, you should all vote on it and take it very seriously. Um, <laughs> I suspect it's likely to make Pesca feel better about turning 50. Um, <laughs> so, 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 I'm um, not voting. I feel like I'm... <laughs> All right. Um, well, can I ask my... one quick question, really? Please. So wait, you asked. So one of the things I, I actually, we this is, everyone loves Terry Gross, and I actually think that she is kind of sycophantic and terrible, and I don't say that because I think that like it's not nice to have a, it's not good to have a rapport, but like I actually say this because of one specific interview with Jay Z in which she asked him about what he means by 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one has been seen as a misogynistic reference. And he told her straight facedly, and she fucking bought it, that it was about a female dog. Yeah, that he had the, owned. Dogs, the dogs would search his car. That's always been his answer. But what yes, do you, you going to do? She was like, yes, yes. But, but she acted like she had gotten something out of him. And she acted, and it was just so like, ugh. Like, <laughs> I just, like, I was just... It was kind of a little bit Barbara Walters, like, if you were a tree, what would you be? Type of, like, kind of, like, like why even bother asking something? Like, I think, Mike, well, if you were a tree, what, what tree would you be? <laughs> Don't answer be that, tree, Mike. I would be Tree Rollins, backup center for the Atlanta Hawks. So, <laughs> um, I think what Terry's philosophy is, is that the guests are, in fact, her guests. And she doesn't do many hard interviews with politicians. I mean, it, uh, others on the network do that. But she feels an obligation to ask a question. It's often about it's often about issues of sexism. When she interviewed Artie Lang and especially Howard Stern, she asked him about you know the sexism in his show. And she also thinks that once you ask a question, right, and get an answer, you've done your job. Yeah. Um, because she's exactly. not running for office, and so like it's not for her to nail him down. Um, yeah. I think her interviewing style, look, I think she's really gracious. I don't know if you heard any of her interviews with um, with um, Sondheim, but he's, I mean, he's obviously brilliant and he doesn't mean anything by his persona, but he's extremely, of course, he's Sondheim. He's extremely exacting about language. And she would ask, she asked the questions about, you know, isn't that discordant? And he would say, no, actually, it's not discordant. It's whatever it is, dysphonious, because discordant is about personal interactions and dysphonious is a musical term. He was actively correcting her, but she was seemed to be happy with that, left it in the interview. And then later she offered an observation. She wasn't cowed by it, right? And it wasn't a battle. She so respects him. She asked a question that showed a lot of insight about music. And I think his appreciation was even more given that he uh, gave her a little correction beforehand. So I, I think she does a really good job. I think the upshot, I mean, how sometimes interviewers seem like they're asking great questions, but the upshot is what did you get out of the interview? And whatever Howard Stern does is he gets a lot, right? He gets a lot. And I think yeah. Terry gets a lot too. Uh, I, I didn't mean to like to make this about Terry Gross. It just, yeah. I should maybe yeah. give her yeah. another well, shot. May, but sorry. But may, I, may I ask a, a, what? So, so um, there was the actual interview. And then I will say I read about the interview 
I'm so embarrassed to say, because um, on Twitter, on the like kind me. of trending, it, oh. it, it, and it was actually unbelievably judgmental. It said something like, in a much maligned interview, this ben is Affleck. what I think Mike is yeah. kind of about to get to. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so I would love to hear like um, how that happened. Right. So how it happened gets to my thesis about disinformation, which is that anyone who is listening intently and wants to honestly and earnestly convey what happened in the interview and not giving anyone a break, just tell the audience as, you know, a representative of the audience as, as, as a... Um, surrogate for the audience hey you didn't hear this interview let me tell you about it what they what you would say are things like you know he's he's honest about his upbringing he told an anecdote afflicted about when he was a teenager when he was in middle school one class from his middle school went to the local courthouse on a field trip and who was being arraigned for drunk driving and cocaine possession? His dad. And they came back and they made fun of Ben Affleck about that. I mean, that's the sort of thing that sticks with you. So this is the kind of thing that you would convey if you were trying to honestly just tell the audience what really happened. But if you're incentivized to do something else, like emphasize outrage, you would do what the New York Post, CNN, and other commentators on these articles did, which is to talk about Ben Affleck says he drank because he was trapped in his marriage to Jennifer Garner. Jen the Jennifer Garner stuff came in later. He in no way maligned her. Sure, he didn't phrase it perhaps optimally if his intention was to say, Jennifer was the greatest person in the world and I in no way blame her. But he quite honestly said, you know, I was very unhappy and how did I deal with it? How I dealt with it is I dealt with it with a bottle and then he got sober afterwards. But the point is, what's the incentive? Where are the incentives? Where are the incentives for clicks? It's essentially a piece of disinformation, right? I mean, the word trapped occurred in the interview and it occurred around Garner, but this was a, a piece of propaganda that was propagated by the New York Post and CNN to ideologically somewhat opposite outlets. And they didn't do it for to skewer uh, one side or the other. They did it because of the tools. The, the easiest thing that the tools do is optimize for outrage. But mm. isn't that, so, okay, mm. this is really an interesting point, but I am going to push back on it because it seems to me that if, that these incentives have been in place since the printing press. Yep. Like, yeah. Well, they're only in place for subscription, for ad-based targeted ads and not for necessarily subscription-based but increasingly, uh, and now that we're 100% paid for, pre like, well, but, like media, but as, because as of long as people have been producing shit, on yes. content, the incentive to produce highly incendiary content because it sells better has been there. Uh, famous, what's his name, William Randolph Hearst line, right? You give me the pictures, the and I'll pictures, the war. and I'll give you the war, right? Like, this is not a new thing. What is new about our current disinformation environment is some other stuff. So I guess my, my question is, is, is this an example of, of just good old-fashioned, uh, uh, you know, Yellow journalism. irresponsibility, uh, <laughs> uh, being, it's a good example of that set in modern times about you know, about a, you know, about Ben Affleck, but it's actually really nothing new under the sun, or is there something unusual about this? Here's what I think is unusual, that in olden times from the Spanish-American War through, uh, you know, 2005, pre-Twitter, the interview that Stern does with Affleck is an extremely prominent platform, right? Uh, Affleck's very famous. The interview occurs in public. Um, not, Stern doesn't have as many listeners on Sirius as he did over the air, but millions of people listen. The write-ups about it in the New York Post are much less, they're, they're um, a flea on the side of the elephant. They're much less important. No matter what the Washington Post or people acting or writing in concert like the Washington Post could do, they can't redefine an interview that took place between, you know, Gore Vidal and Johnny Carson. 
they can't rewrite the history or give everyone a different impression about something that happened in a prominent broadcast platform. But now you can, because as many people heard the Affleck and Stern, which was not a small, quiet thing, it is just inundated and flooded by the uh, bullhorn power of Twitter and by the fact that once this headline and write-up comes out, you have people with millions or hundreds of followers like Roxanne Gay writing about this. I was rooting for Ben Affleck, but to blame his drinking on his marriage to Jennifer Garner is so silly. He didn't do that. She dried his ass out multiple times, even after they broke up. He best take himself to a meeting or something. And then someone said to uh, her, did you even listen to the interview? And she answered, oh, I don't have it right here. But like, she answered something like, I did, bitch. So the point is, and what I think is different is that the megaphone or the recasting of this, no matter how big Pulitzer's papers were, they weren't bigger than, say, the, the, uh, something as big as a stern interview with Affleck. That's what I think is different. The reality of this interview to the mass majority of people who encountered it in any way was the inaccurate, anti-Jennifer uh, Garner write-up. And I think that is something different than it used to be. I disagree, like completely. I think that like- All right, pugilism week. No, I mean like- V, Pasca, bum, no, bum, no, bum, I, bum, I, bum, I, bum, I, bum, Here's bum, what bum. I think, here's what I think is different, Mike. And I, I, I don't disagree with what your characterization of what happened. I want to like, first of all, say like that, like what you described happened, absolutely happened. You had the New York yeah, yeah. Post take these quotes out of context and actually, uh, the reason I knew exactly what you're talking about and what you were talking about with misinformation was because I had um, woken up. This was like a couple nights ago when I woke up at 430 in the morning and I couldn't fall back asleep. And it came up in like my Chromecast that this like thing had like it was like, oh, or like Chrome. Like anyways. And so I had listened to it on my AirPods and then like had read the things and saw how out of context it was. And I was like, wow, this is like straight up yellow journalism on behalf of the New York Post, and this is going to be everywhere in the next two days. And this is not, I don't even like concentrate on missing disinformation. But what I do concentrate is on the ad models of these platforms and how they interact with user generated content and media generated content like links and things like stories and things like that. I mean, what you're basically saying is that at one point, Howard Stern had a definitive broadcast that was actually more like Pulitzer, <laughs> like in which he could make and cut and edit anything he wanted and control it wholly, basically because he was more powerful than all of the little fly on the elephants. And now we have a lot of flies on the elephant, or actually we just have a lot more elephants or a lot more flies or like a smaller <laughs> elephant or like my general takeaway is basically that this is not like what you basically have here is like a democratization through user generated content of like these individual people having Roxanne Gay having like her own fucking show because a hundred <laughs> like 200,000 people fucking subscribe to her on Twitter. It's the same thing. And so like, sorry, yes, you're right. Like, but could all of these people still go and fucking fact check and listen to the broadcast? Yes, they do. Do they not? No, they don't. Why? Because we still do the same thing we did back in whole, Pulitzer and Hertz Day, which was like basically to just trust the newsies on the corner selling the papers. Like, and I, I genuinely think that this is like, I've had a few conversations with some like old newspaper and magazine people in the last, like, like people that I was like, were a couple, like a decade or two ahead of me and kind of in the transition. Like I was at the very beginning of the transition to web media, web media and like, they to a person like have come like at a cocktail never in like a interview or anything but in a cocktail party they'll say things like you know we really have to maybe think about the fact that the entire subscription model of our entire like industry is now based on the exact same things that we're hitting facebook and twitter and youtube for and i'm like oh yeah because guess what the complaint about selling outrage is no different if you're selling clicks to a New York Times or New York Post story than it is if you're just selling engagement on Facebook. It is the same thing. And in fact, basically we're in like a kind of, I think a golden age of like a couple of years in which 
the media has figured out pretty well how to SEO, like all of these various platforms. And they're in a sweet spot of like being able to like no longer make money on this anymore. But like, this is, this is, I think that there's no, if you, if you're principled, the problems that you have with Facebook about generating outrage and feeding you outrage are the same problems that you'd have with any type of like, any type of like news source and how they package a headline, honestly. Yeah, um, well, I don't, I don't object. I mean, I object, but I don't expect <laughs> differently from the New York Post and there's something, you know, rep, they're rep scallions and they would probably do this with an interview that Howard Stern had done on uh, K-Rock. But, so I use the fly. What I really mean is more like the mosquitoes, something that, you know, draws sustenance from the elephant. And here's my analogy. I think Twitter makes it different. Like you'd always have yellow journalism. You'd always have people trying to optimize for an outrage in an interview and maybe take it out of context. But what Twitter is doing is they have invented a system that all they do is they check the DNA, they check the uh, DNA or the, the suckling of the mosquito in order to tell you what the DNA of the elephant was. So their their uh, their concept is a heck we're going to tell you, you got going here. We're yeah, going to tell you what the world is. We're going to monitor mosquitoes from this monitoring mosquitoes. You're going to be able to draw some inference from the elephant they've been sucking from. <laughs> and I think that's a that's a flawed way to reflect the world. Wait, because you see it on Twitter, you think <laughs> that it's real? I don't understand. What I'm saying is that Twitter cannot possibly take into account an actual Ben Affleck interview. I don't mean the whole thing. Like, there is no way that the uh, facts of that make it through this very important information portal, right? The thing that's definitely going to make it through is the uh, scurrilous write-up. And that's what yeah, Twitter's built for. Of course. But that's different, be be but because that's different Twitter... from media from 20 to 120 years ago. Yes, because one thing Twitter doesn't have is editors. And there's, right. there's actually, at the end of the day, no substitute for it. Um, you can crowdsource editing uh, in a old-fashioned, non-content moderated way, and you get terrible outcomes and then you can crowdsource it with a like mo modern social media companies do with a layer of humans doing um humans and machines doing content moderation uh, about terms of service which will improve the accuracy somewhat but won't get you to the difference between uh an, an accurate Ben Affleck interview and an inaccurate Ben Affleck interview, though it might get you the difference between an, ac an inaccurate Ben Affleck interview and Ben Affleck saying, I'm going to kill you motherfuckers. I'm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, or, or, you know, giving out vaccine disinformation, but it's not going to get you to accuracy within the journalistic sense that you mean it. To do that, you need editors. And that's the thing that, like, social media companies actually can't contemplate doing through a comp because of their weird combination of business model, which doesn't imagine editing at scale. Like, if yeah. they did that, they would be the Washington Post, right? And that would be a fine thing to be, but it wouldn't be a social media company. Um, but also because they actually have and mean a weird kind of free speech ethos. Well, here's I, I, I of course agree that the lack of editors means all, all manner of uh, poor outcomes. But I thought this was interesting because usually when we talk about how not having standards and not having la uh, editors and and the uh, the yellow journalism riding uh, herd over the truth. It's usually in a context of, well, the more boring story is actually the better story. The less sensational story is better. Um, or even there's a Democrat or Republican skew. In, in my mind, the more accurate and interesting and not in a deep, you have to work at it way, like Ben Affleck for the first time talking about his 
coke addicted father is really interesting right and it's not like a better angel of our nature sort of interesting where if you would only please listen to that i think howard stern is a more interesting um presentation of forget that it's closer to what actually happened or at least uh, actually happened as seen through the eyes of ben affleck like howard stern has a better finger on what's interesting than the new york post write-up does or that the twitter take does but in this case the less interesting more um you know predictable uh, headlines were the ones that won out this that was that's the story that won I'm going to go plug in my computer, but also think about this deeply. Ben, you're muted. I'm now ben, on you're the muted. big screen. I'm now on the big screen. Hi. Hi. Um, Scott, go and ask your question. Um, okay, Kate. Um, um, did, we, did, <laughs> did we, in fact, lock, lock eyes when I when I said that? Um, I think that... Uh, the what I have learned, I think that the term for for Zoom um, is that is the Zoom gift of the Magi that you can not both receive and give eye contact at the same time, like at the same time. Um, right. So like I can look up into the camera and if you're looking at me on the screen right now, it'll right. look like we lock eyes, okay. but I looked at the I camera. Got, <laughs> I got you. I got you. Right. OK. I, so I just 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 to push back just a little bit, just. I would say, so like Twitter is but one platform, right? So we had we had Nate Persley on yesterday talking about the importance of WhatsApp um, yeah. um, for for information dissemination, and then there's of course Instagram and Snapchat and of course Facebook, and then there's just like the web and people who like really just go from the New York Times to the Washington Post web page. Um, and then there's people who follow their blogs. And I mean, so it does kind of feel like Twitter may loom large for many of us who are in, you know, like if we're journalists or academics or, 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 or that, but, but, but maybe it, it, the question is like, was it being carried in the same way on these other platforms? I'm not on whatsapp so i don't know and probably it didn't well i don't know if you guys saw any pickup on no, it went by it was a it was a legit viral thing across the web like i didn't even initially see it in the trending on twitter again i saw it on like apple news in oh, the headline oh, really? that you had uh, that mike had like that, that is a but, but but the but the editorializing one that is like much yes. disparaged i say okay yes. well that that's actually the New York really Post headline I, I see. So it's not just so it's not just Twitter. It's whatever the pipeline is, which is just generally this is a little bit like so, Mike, I'm going to throw another two analogies at you. Well, one, I'm going to say that, like, whatever your gri gripes are, they're with The New York Post um, and CNN. They were just as bad. <laughs> yeah. But like, again, this is just like, well, they're like, you know, I also want to say The New York Post this week took a like had two shitty journalists that are like kind of like just crapola dudes that like walked down the street and saw a bunch of heroin addicts like shooting up on like a like like on a, in a street and took photos of like this is Biden's America and posted yeah. it and like it just like just like a like a there really were no sad heroin addicts before Biden became president yeah and it was just like it wasn't. It was yeah. like it was just like look at these junkies <laughs> shooting up on the street it's in Manhattan. The 1970s. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all over again. Um, but anyways, my point is, is like there are there they 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 specialize in this. This is literally what they do is they write this type of salacious, marginalized content with a very thin relationship with the truth. Um, but there is a I'm gonna like what you're kind of proposing to a certain degree. And it's interesting is like think about twitter as like a newsstand and it but like instead of like it being a private decision what you decide to buy at a newsstand like mm -hmm. that you buy the national Enquirer, or you know you feel a little guilty putting it on the on like the the scanner <laughs> like in front of like the bag lady but you also got the economist in there and like harper's so like you're fine <laughs> but mm -hmm. like like that you you're, there's no performance 
like you can click on all of the shitty clickbait that you want and you don't have to perform for anyone. And all they do is reflect right. back to you more and more of what you want to see. And so like, is it the fault that like there's high demand for bullshit headlines about Ben Affleck that turn out to have a thin relationship with the truth that seem to be premised on something quite serious? Like, is that like, isn't that a problem with like, like, not just the New York Post serving it up, but like, what are we going to do? Regulate the New York Post out of existence? Are we going to get rid of the National Enquirer? Like, are we going to have like, you have to have like your broccoli with your National Enquirer? Like, what yeah. is it like? What right. are we? Right. So this is, this is why we designed Lawfare the way we did, which was to reflect back at you. So if you click, for example, on the article, the clickbait article using a sanctions framework to fix the ICTS executive order on lawfare, it yeah. will serve you up the following articles. Will China retaliate against US chip sanctions on the legality of policy recommend ramifications of high seas seizures of foreign merchant vessels for violating US sanctions, etc. So like we are part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I would I, I that that's I, by the way, and I'll admit this to everyone, but I've clicked on those. I, you know, it was a guilty pleasure, but still. Um, but, but, but I mean, what, what Kate's pointing out is particularly important here, which is that, like, um, you know, like, there's the demand, but like, there's no reason for us to feel bad about the production because it's a demand on something that doesn't really matter. I mean, it may matter to Ben Affleck, but it, it's not like disinformation on things that matter, right? Um, and so, and, uh, but it's exactly Ben Affleck. But doesn't it play out in exactly the same way? The Affleck example is one that we. Could, it's good to think about, and you I, could. Uh, you know, you don't have to get emotionally involved and say, oh, it was legitimate for to talk about Hunter Biden's laptop or illegitimate. It just kind of is a um, it, ju it just shows the dynamic at I, play absent. I, yeah, the normal. Emotion. Yeah, yeah, I would. I guess I guess I would say the following is that I would be surprised if there was ever a time in it, it, when there was production of print in the marketplace where at least things of entertainment value wasn't weren't designed to like get people to read it i mean that is that that's right. like the only metric the issue yeah. which is really different now is you know or something that maybe it's not different but it's shocking to it's not shocking that the ben affleck thing happened in the way that it did um though it's disconcerting it's not shocking it is kind of shocking when people do about like life-saving vaccines yeah, it right. has, I mean, the, the stakes are a lot higher. You know, to me, I, I'll throw a couple, couple more things to think about. Um, one is, Kate, you were talking about people in journalism talking about their subscription model. Isn't our subscription model seriously flawed? What of the fact that who has a better subscription model than Howard Stern, right? Here is a man who has made literally hundreds of millions of dollars from a subscription model, subscription model that I, was go, I would go far as to say, I think this is probably true, Every single news organization would trade their subscription base for maybe not the New York Times, but maybe the New York Times. Every single one would trade their subscription base and profitability for Howard Stern's. Right. Wait, but I, Howard... I don't understand what you're saying, though. Like no one pays money to listen to Howard Stern. He's free on the airwaves before he had a no, satellite no, no. radio thing. Right. So, so yeah. I'm like differentiating between a subscription model, which is like that you pay a day, like a regular rate, like yes. for content versus free content for and you have ads and most are mixed. Right. Here, but like no, one of the reasons. Point, yeah. That if we all acknowledge that the media subscription model is flawed and they can somehow replace their flawed subscription model with a robust subscription model that allows them to do the journalistic equivalent of Howard Stern, which is more content or better content and really remunerative content, it will still, it will still lose to someone who's not playing by the subscription model. It will still lose to the Twitters and the person just trying to get the eyeballs of the New York Post. 
I wanted to say that there is, um, I know we have to go to audience questions, but I just want to say that you were also making this argument about Howard Stern, who, when I was growing up, was the guy famous for constantly having porn actresses on his show and asking them uncomfortable questions about his, about like the positions that they liked best. And yeah. then also doing an entire movie that was called Private Parts that was just about him acting in pornographic films. And like, so like, it's like, no. I, I get that that's, that's not no, what no, Private no. Parts was about. <laughs> well, all I know is that there was a giant empire state building in place of his woohoo. Oh yeah. That was brand <laughs> so, Oh yeah, and, okay. and a lot of Ford content too, right? Right. So <laughs> All like, right. I, okay. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, you have uh, been very patient. You are kind of in your native habitat, but only kind of. And the floor is yours. So I have a question about the earlier conversation regarding COVID. When we say that COVID is going to become more like the flu and become less severe overall, are we assuming this is going to be true for? unvaccinated people as well. I've always assumed that this is just going to be true for the vaccinated, but I'm just wondering what what your guys' thoughts on this are. What do you think, Mike? No, I think that's the right point. When I say it's just like the flu, it's exactly from my privileged, okay, I opted into the privileged perspective. Yeah, privilege should be an American perspective of being vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, Mr. Arduous, you have waited arduous, arduously, oh, and the floor is yours. Sorry, I haven't, I haven't heard that one before. Um, so uh, I, I wonder whether you guys, if, if you were like the editor of the New York Times or the Washington Post, would would you cover this Project Veritas story and? with Ashley Biden's journal, the way that the New York Times ran a, a, a long piece, I think yesterday or the other day. I, I would think from my perspective that that, that just gives Project Veritas and uh, O'Keefe just publicity that he doesn't need. Um, and I, I wonder whether sort of putting a, a, a long story like that and ex, 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 sort of ex, extensively covering uh, like this trolling journalism it's almost like uh uh what, what does he get kind of kind of how would you describe it like a uh, blackmailed journalism style if you can call it journalism operations against democrats and uh people that don't agree with trump uh how, how would how would you deal with him would would you just sort of not give him the coverage or does does, does having coverage in the new york times a amplify Project Veritas and all these sort of fringe media, or if you can call them that, and, and it, sort of people that are just trying to do hit pieces against Democrats and and journalists, and sort of sully the reputation of in, in investigation, investigative journalism, and be just trolls. What do you think? Well, I was aware of. Uh, the supposed contents months ago because Laura, Lauren Boebert was tweeting it, like just tweeting screen supposed screenshots. So it's tough. I mean, she has millions of followers. There are tens of millions of people easily who quote unquote know what is in Ashley Biden's diary. So that kind of makes it news, but you know, you do have to weigh, all right, are we amplifying some really, yeah, some really bad journalism and scurrilous lies? It crosses a point where it's like, this story, the story that I read in the New York Times, is a worthy story to me. I I'm almost always on the side of uh, on the side of speech and putting things out there, especially when they've crossed the threshold of okay, millions and millions of people already know about it, and those millions are all convinced that there's where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, I mean, I think it is very hard for a newspaper to justify not publishing truthful, important information. Uh, of course, that doesn't answer the question of whether the information that Project Verify, Veritas generates is either truthful or important. Leave that question for a different day. But the posture of newspapers as a general matter is not that they will decline to publish material that was acquired unethically. They don't acquire material themselves unethically by their standards of ethics, 
which I think are probably quite reasonable standards as a general matter. But they publish stuff that's stolen all the time and, um, and you know, and stuff that is the people who give to them are not authorized to take um, or to distribute. Uh, those people are what journalists call sources. And so it's, it becomes a very dicey thing to take the principled position, oh, we'll take an anonymous leak of the president's tax returns uh, for, that shows up in the mail one day if we can verify it, but we'll, you know, reach for the smelling salts if Project Veritas does something uh, unethical to to Ashley Biden. I, you know, we could we can argue about the the details, but I, I just think it's a very, very difficult thing to ask newspapers to do. And in fact, it's not something that they do as a general matter. Itamar, the floor is yours. All right. So the Hi, so the discussion uh, about uh, like yellow journalism and different uh, models kind of reminded me of a concern I had with Lawfare blog, uh, specifically the the podcast, which is most of your content that I consume. Uh, I feel kind of weird sometimes when I hear like your your advertisements, and granted, I don't have to worry about you or your employees eating or being warm at night. So I understand that you have to make these decisions. But well, in particular, when I hear your voice uh, vouching for a particular product, I feel that's kind of different than having a pre-recorded ad. And it feels kind of weird, specifically, for example, with ExpressVPN, where it's like I have a bit of technical knowledge on the subject. And like some of what you say is like, okay but like not not exactly how i would add i would oh, the express vpn people have intervened <laughs> to, <laughs> to prevent it did they find out that that's how i'm dialing into the show right now yeah. from pakistan um, sorry you were about to f you you froze in the middle of saying that i think i've got i think i got your question though and um let me answer it. Um, so I agree with you that post red advertising um, is a weird thing on podcasting. It's something that on um, in you know newspapers you have a very strict ad edit separation, um, and the people responsible for editorial side work just don't do the advertising stuff. Podcasts blur that, and people like Mike Pasca and I, in uh, him in a for-profit context, and I in a not-for-profit context, uh, end up reading some ads somewhere. So you ask, like, what are Lawfare's ad policies? Uh, interestingly, uh, so here are the ones we use. First of all, we turn down a very large number of ad requests. Um, that we have whole categories of uh, ads that we just don't do as a matter of, um, and second, we vet all advertising requests between uh, three people, me, David Priest, and Natalie. <laughs> uh, and one of us voting no vetoes an ad. Um, uh, and third, we will not do any advertising uh, representing that we have used a product that we have not e ever used. So um, I actually do use ExpressVPN. I do listen to uh, the uh, Financial <coughs> Times' daily uh, morning briefing. Um, and, um, uh, and so there's a, um, you know, I do think it's in, for exactly the reason that you identify, it's incumbent upon, I don't know what the standard practice in the industry, by the way, is I, I, I have a feeling that your sense that a lot of people just read ad copy for uh, uh, and use their voice for that is um, probably right. Um, I don't feel like I should be saying things to lawfare readers about my use of products that aren't uh, true. Um, and so we try to be careful about it. Um, uh, we also 
are very aware that this is, you know, the standard practice in the industry is host red ads and and we there's never a time where we don't identify ads as ads, right? So it's we don't like some places embed them into the content of the show. We don't do that. Uh, and look, ultimately, is there some brand risk associated for lawfare of carrying advertising? Uh, sure. Uh, and you know, we have to balance that against the uh, diversity of revenue streams that we need in order to keep the site active. Uh, and so that's the the best I can tell you about the answer. And I will also say, you know, if you join our Patreon, uh, you can get ad-free versions of all our podcasts. Mike Pesca, you have read more uh, ad copy uh, than I will ever dream about. How do you feel about host red ads? I subscribe to everything that you do. And I was thinking about that, that uh, specific VPN ad and if we got it, because I did read a good article about how the necessity of some of the technology has, it used to be quite necessary and now maybe it's not as necessary as it once was, but I don't know. I hear you read the ad. I hear Kara Swisher read the ad. I'm like these two people. And you just said you use the product. I, I literally good. have it on right now. Okay. So that seems good enough for me. I'll read. Someone might wish to use the product that you use. And so you can tell them about it and they can help support your show. That seems fine. Scott, before you teach class, do you like have like an ad, a host yeah. content that is you your, just like? Is your class sponsored by uh, HelloFresh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, re I really wish I had a snappy re retort. You're, that, you're, uh, it's, it's, it's sponsored by a $250 case book. So that's usually yeah, sponsored I, by. I swear to God, I, I had this idea be, before I became, uh, before I was, um, involved with the show, I was thinking of doing this, my own podcast. And I wanted to do, it was called make the list podcast about making a list. Um, and I was, I love but, that idea. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I played around with it. I started, I interviewed, um, Bruce Ackerman, um, for, for a couple of hours. And it just it was, I just could not wrestle the thing into an episode format, but I did before the law school gave me funding for it. Um, I was going to do as part of the gag, um, host, uh, you know, a host read, uh, a advertising, but having Bruce Ackerman do the thing, um, and I, cause I thought that would be fucking hilarious. Um, you know, I can Bruce reading something for, uh, you know, express VPN or some Herva light thing. Um, um so, yeah, <laughs> this way so, now, ask me how. Yeah, yeah. just, just to be clear, we do not do any dietary supplement ads of any kind. Oh, why is that by the way? Go, oh, just because like it's, uh, it, that's, just, that seems like vouching. Snake, or, snake oil to uh, directly. There's a lot of, first <laughs> of all, cause we're in no sense in a position to evaluate any aspect of them. Like, uh, secondly, cause you know, they have this weird exemption from, uh, from all kinds of FDA regulations. So oh, they right. can say almost anything they want. And you end up in the position where you end up lying about things without knowing it. Um, and I don't want to do that. Um, yeah, we also don't I do, we, we also I rejected, don't do, sorry, go ahead. I rejected ads all the time. I think I was maybe a little too persnickety about it. Like uh, I rejected ads for either DraftKings or one of the other gambling sites when they were around and advertising the first time and then they went away and now they're everywhere. So that you have to look at the market too. Me, hmm. Uh, rejecting ads when they're sponsoring, you know, Pat McAfee's show for $50 million. Uh, what kind of stance am I making? I'm not even against the gambling apps now that they're legal. So, yeah. But, yeah, I, I guess... may, may, but, but really, the, I think the most, I think the crucial question I have is not the ethics of it, but like, how does it make you feel? That is, do you, do, do you like, this is my job? and whatever or do you find it at all and and i'm not saying you should I'm but so you feel it's demeaning my, i'm so interested in pesca's answer to this me too yeah i, I feel have... ex i feel exactly like I, I i think mike shore should feel when in during an ad break in the good place they tell you to buy a tacoma truck like 
it, it's not that much where even though Mike Shore is not doing the ad, it's the same exact thing. He's the creator of The Good Place. It's the same exact thing that's going on. So as long as the uh, product isn't doing any harm, and I also think, and I sometimes explain this, that there are certain products that have a free trial that I think you might like, and you know you're supporting the show. So that's a symbiotic relationship as a listener. You understand. Uh, I wouldn't tell them to subscribe to a product that it isn't easy to get out of uh, after a free trial, but it's the only way that the show can stay on the air. I mean, Yale has a $31.2 billion endowment. I just looked that up. You don't have to do an ad. I wish I, wish I was in that case. That I was going to say, and I was going to say, <laughs> never mind the fact of like whatever, the, I was like, it is truly a subscription model in that you pay $60,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I want to go outflank Pesca on this. I love reading the ad copy. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because every dime we bring in through ad copy on the podcast funds some portion of Lawfare. And I don't have to go out and talk to major donors for yep. that dollar. And when I fund something through advertising, it's transparent. Uh, yeah. Everybody gets to listen to the ExpressVPN ad and say, I don't like ExpressVPN. I think this ad copy is is not entirely worthy of Ben Wittes. You get to judge me for it. You don't you don't have to look into what our what our back under what our understanding was with a foundation. You don't have to look at um, uh, you don't have to trust me about whether there was a um, uh, whether there was some uh, content uh, requirements hovering over a deal. Um, and it's, it's really clear to the viewer, it's with the exception of individual user small donations, it's the best money we get. And it has no strings attached. I can denounce ExpressVPN in literally the next sentence if I want to. Um, and so I love it. I think I wish I could fund the whole site with it. I wouldn't do it because you can't def because in order to do that, you have to deface the site with advertising. But I wish a heavier percentage of our um, my one caveat to that is I want to be the only person who reads the ad copy. And I don't let any of my staff do it because I feel like all of the responsibility for that, you know, mm. if one of those companies turns out to be a scam, turns out to be ripping people off, if ExpressVPN turns out to be a front for the Chinese government or whatever, I want to be responsible for, for the things that we've said about that. I don't want, you know, Quinta Jurassic to, to get criticism for that. Right. I, I mean, I will just say that, like, for, for what it's worth, like, in journalism, this is why... Um, us, like an ad based revenue is like is is kind of a thing like right they think that the entire idea of having ads on in a newspaper was because it was a public facing good and there was like kind of an idea that you were trying to make it as cheap as possible and as widely available as possible and like mm -hmm. the ability to like have a banker pay 10 cents for a paper and a boot like uh, like a boot polisher pay 10 cents for a paper. And then that that was like, maybe you didn't do that. Maybe you got it to hand delivered to your door every day. You know, like all of these things that like, there was a democratization in the, so this is like also something I don't quite understand. It's like the absolute, as Ben just said it really, really well, like the absolute vitriol we have towards ads and subscription based stuff or like, or like targeted advertising. Cause like, I just don't understand, like we've done this forever. And it was like, actually, we were just bad at it. And so you would get like a really shitty ad targeted at you all well, the you know, time. That, I, I, think that, I think that's the difference, which was that it used to be that the advertising-based model was maximally inclusive because you didn't want to yes. you know, scare away pe pe people. But now, actually, ad-based model and subscription was like for the passionately... Um, um, you know, the minorities that were really passionate enough but so could pay for it. But now you have the ad-based models actually, because of targeting, behavioral targeting, um, becoming less and less, uh, generating more and more outrage-inducing outrage content. Yeah. Let me, right. it, fits so, in, it fits into a general, I'll quickly say this, 
Uh, I praise inefficiency. It shows up in many ways. We want to stamp it out. But think about when political parties were inefficient. Which one's conservative? Which one's Democrat? It was much better. <laughs> think about think about when advertising was inefficient. Oh my God, half the money is wasted. Think about the uh, inef- inefficiencies that Jeff Bezos figured out with uh, the supply chain. I mean, the more efficient you get, think about purebred dogs. The more efficient you get, the more flaws that show up. Inefficiency needs to be praised more often. All right. I want to go to one last question that I have for Pesca. But before we do, I have to say this episode of In Lieu of Fun is brought to you by Hertz. Um, and, uh, uh, to, you know, there are a lot of companies that can wreck your, your holidays, but there are few that can fuck it up as badly, as completely, and as painfully as we can. So, um, uh, uh, Hertz, uh, you want to come sponsor in lieu of fun? Yeah. Bring it. We the should have them off. Too. <laughs> All right. Mike Pesca, uh, I know you are not ready to make an announcement here on In Lieu of Fun, and I'm not going to ask not. you to, but okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you to make a meta announcement. Do you have any announcement to make about an announcement that you might someday be in a position to make like a time or date or like a you know philosophical what what position you'll be reclining in you know any any news you can give us uh well nixon resigned i don't know if you saw that it's up here (laughs) (laughs) that's what i uh if you subscribed to the gist in that feed keep the subscription fresh sometime in the earliest parts of 2022 uh announcements will be made episodes will be dropped and there's a mikepesca.com website that can tell you more about announcements about announcements so announcements are forthcoming all right so you heard that mikepesca.com and if you ever subscribed to the gist or even if you haven't you still can't well i was going to get to that if you ever (laughs) subscribe to the gist don't let that subscription go because we have an announcement that there will be an announcement in the early part of the year and if you've never subscribed to the gist um uh you know like this is the time to do it because like there's going to be an announcement about an announcement all right i'm very excited for the gist to come back uh, we didn't say anything about that because that would or be an announcement. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Right we're, we're, there's going to be an announcement. That'll be uh, sometime in the new year. We will be back, however, sometime on Monday, which is still the old year. We are going to have, I believe, Maggie Feldman Pilch and uh, one of the Afghan pilots that uh, she helped uh, evacuate from Afghanistan. Uh, over the summer, um, uh, along with an incredible story of the work that they did on that project. Um, That'll be a bunch of hours and 56 minutes from now. And until then, Mike Pesca. Well, you can't have fun, but help me. Can I can I can I can I can I give you one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we can have my, this would be in your voice my much maligned appearance on in lieu of fun okay yeah but you exactly i just want to before we go i want to point out that mike pesca according to the audience vote mike pesca got zero votes for he should oh, feel God. the worst for turning 50. <laughs> uh scott a lot of people 46 percent of the uh, the divided audience roughly the amount that voted for trump voted that Scott should feel the worst for still being behind Rick Grinnell in Twitter followers. And the majority, the Biden vote roughly, uh, said that Kate should feel this, the worst I didn't for vote in this. having to put up with me asking stupid questions like this in the polls for 569 episodes. We will see you later, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You're a great American. <laughs>